It's fantastic when you stand at the front of a room and it goes quiet. I appreciate that. Good evening and welcome to tonight's lecture, The Science Behind H1N1, Evolution, Pathology, Vaccines, and Adjuvants. I appreciate you coming out on this drizzly cold November evening. I'm sure that we'll have a fantastic uh, time. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Vice President, Academic, and Provost, Ferdinand Amdelepper. Thank you and good evening everybody. Uh, my role is simply here uh, to welcome you all to the University of Waterloo. Those are those of you who are not from the university and those of you who are from the university and especially our students. Thank you for being here. This is a very important and exciting event and uh, it is also very timely. Uh, we are going through very interesting times, at least to say. The, uh, Climate change, global economic crisis, and H1N1. These are the uh, three main topics probably keeping everybody busy. And I think the universities can play a very, very important role in educating everybody, our students, our public, by finding new knowledge and disseminating this knowledge to everybody. And the science behind H H1N1 is one of the examples. The only way we can, we can tackle these challenges is to know more about these things and share our knowledge with everybody uh, that what we know. Uh, I, I especially wanted to thank you, our Department of Biology and the Faculty of Science for their initiative to come up with this lecture and panel discussion. And I think the more we know about this virus, I think the better off we will be. So, uh, starting with the chair and our speaker and the dean, I thank you for your initiative and hopefully we will have more. Uh, the, the virus, I think, is going to go away, but these kind of challenges will not. So I thank you for your initiative and I, I welcome and invite you to, for more initiatives of these kinds. I know we have, we have a speaker and the panelists, so you don't want to hear a lot from me. I will be quiet. and. Uh, but before I sit down, I wanted to thank you, our speaker and our panelists, for being here and enjoy the evening. There is no test after this one. <laughs> thank you very much, Ferd, and we really appreciate you, you coming out. Um, so my name is David Rose. I'm the, the chair of the Department of Biology here at the University of Waterloo. And um, we're, really be, we're really excited to be able to host this evening along with the Faculty of Science. And uh, it's really heartening and delightful to see uh, so many people here. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking about this, the science behind influenza in general and the H1N1 in particular. Um, and the questions are all the news stories really hype or reality? Are we being prudent or overreacting? Is immunization effective or risky, a waste of time and money, or is the whole thing a conspiracy by people who sell the vaccine and those little plastic bottles of, of hand wash? <laughs> anyway, these are all the questions that we hope to touch on this evening, and it will be up to you to make sure that they are asked and answered by our distinguished panel, who we're uh, excited to hear from. Uh, but first, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Christine Dupont from the Department of Biology. Dr. Dupont has training and experience both as a scientist and as a teacher. And as you'll hear in a few minutes, is one of our most talented lecturers. She completed her bachelor's and her master's degrees from Guelph. Anybody here from University of Guelph? Hey. All right. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, and then Christine went and did a, an education, a bachelor of education at Windsor. Anybody here from Windsor? No. That's, oh, there we go. All right. Good stuff. Um, and then uh, following that, um, Christine went to do her PhD in New Zealand. Anyone here from New Zealand? <laughs> Oh well, it was worth asking, I guess. Um, and for her PhD, um, Christine was studying what makes some pathogens particularly infective and how our immune system responds to them, so very timely topics for this lecture. Um, among the things that Dr. DuPont is going to touch on is how our immune systems can adapt to respond to infections and the way in which viruses like H1N1 can evolve before our eyes to become resistant to medications. So it's particularly appropriate that this event is being held in conjunction with the 150th anniversary of the publication of, of Charles Darwin's Origin of Species, um, where the concept of natural selection was first laid out. So without further ado, um, Christine Dupont. Thank you, Dr. Rose. It's really great to be here to see such a group of people who are interested in this topic. 
And I think I shouldn't be surprised about that. It certainly does seem to be on everybody's mind these days. I teach a fourth year virology course here at Waterloo, and influenza viruses um, always feature prominently in that course, even before the pandemic. And so while I certainly don't consider myself to be an expert in influenza, I've come to know these viruses quite well. There's never a dull moment in influenza viruses. Apologies, we're on the wrong show. Here we go. All right, so I'm going to structure my talk beginning with defining what a virus is, and then I'm gonna move into influenza viruses specifically, how they cause pandemics, and a little bit about the vaccines. So what is a virus? Viruses are very simple biological entities, and in the words of Peter Medawar, they are a bit of bad news wrapped in protein. And that is certainly an apt description of viruses. They're actually very simple. They have a small genome of either RNA or DNA, and that contains all the genetic information that they need in order to make new progeny viruses. And this genome is encased in a protein shell, and you see a lot of examples of the strange, weird, and wonderful shapes that those protein shells give viruses. And they're all genetic parasites, which means they download their genetic information into a host cell. And that directs all of the host cell machinery into making new virus progeny particles. And this does this at the expense of the host cell. So they kind of hijack cell systems. They're very small compared to our own cells. You're looking at uh, a, a human herpes virus, and if you've ever had chicken pox or cold sores, then you've had experience with this virus. It's actually a very large DNA virus. And below it, we have a very small virus. This is polio virus. So what about influenza viruses? I'm going to take you through a little bit about the evolution of influenza viruses, not just because it's Darwin Day, but because it's very interesting how these things have come to us. Influenza A viruses all reside in aquatic bird species, so ducks and geese and swans and things like that. And from this pool of viruses, we have two um, separate lineages, influenza B viruses and influenza C viruses. And these infect primarily humans and a few other animal species, and they do not cause pandemics. Influenza A viruses, so even though the reservoir is aquatic bird species, they don't always stay there. And influenza A viruses are notorious for jumping the species barrier and moving into hosts like pigs and humans, and when they do this, they cause pandemics. In fact, influenza A viruses are actually very good at moving into a variety of different host species, and you see just a small sampling of hosts we know, species we know, that can be infected with influenza A viruses. And the list continues to grow. It seems the, the more you look, the more you'll find. So it's a very successful virus. And now I'm going to move into some of the molecular biology of this virus, so a bit about the structure. And it's really important to examine the structure of this virus because it directly relates to its ability to infect different host species and cause pandemics. All influenza A viruses have a genome that's made up of eight different segments of RNA. And so you're looking here at a cross-section of one of those genomic segments, and there's that spiral of RNA and it's surrounded by a coat of protein. And each of those segments codes for one or two of the viral proteins. And that genome is surrounded by a viral envelope. And that envelope is partly derived from the host cell. So as the virus is getting ready to leave the host cell, it sort of buds out of the host cell and takes some of the cell membrane with it. And so when it leaves you, it takes a little bit of you along with it. Just as it's getting ready to leave, the new virus particle inserts some of its own viral proteins into that membrane, that envelope. And one of these viral proteins is very important, and I'm going to focus a lot on this particular viral protein. This is the hemagglutinin molecule called hemagglutinin A, and it um, allows the virus to attach to a host cell. And you see it here, it kind of looks like a molecule with a stalk, and it's got some balls or knobs on the end of it. And it's those knobs that are responsible for um, binding to a host cell, and that initiates infection. 
So if the virus can't bind through this hemagglutinin molecule, then infection cannot occur. And the second uh, viral protein that's inserted into that envelope is neuraminidase. And neuraminidase facilitates uh, new virus particles from leaving the host cell. And incidentally, Tamiflu, the um, anti-influenza uh, therapeutic drug, targets this neuraminidase. And so when the new viruses are trying to leave the host cell, um, they can't. They can't detach. They kind of remain tethered to the host cell. And so they can't go out and spread and infect other cells, and that limits the course and severity of disease. And the importance in these two molecules, and hemagglutinin especially, is that they're major immune targets. So if you can make antibody to, for example, hemagglutinin, then that's going to block that hemagglutinin molecule from being able to attach to the host cell and stop infection. And of course, our influenza viral, virus um, vaccines all contain these components. And so when it's injected into your arm, um, your body thinks it's the real thing, uh, has an immune response, you make antibody to these, and that antibody then is ready to be produced, and when the real influenza virus enters, it's going to bind to these hemagglutinin molecules, and that's going to stop that virus from being able to attach and infect host cells. Now, there's lots of different kinds of hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. So there's 16 different kinds of hemagglutinin molecules. So we have H1, H2, H3, etc. And the same with neuraminidase. And that leads to uh, a naming system of these subtypes of influenza A viruses that you're probably somewhat familiar with. So H1N1, for example, H3N2, H5N1, and so our, our current swine influenza. This is one of our uh, circulating seasonal flu viruses. And this represents the avian flu. And I'm going to come back to that avian flu a little bit later. And the importance of this is um, they're named according to the particular combination then of hemagglutinin and neuraminidase that they contain. And if you have antibody against, say, hemagglutinin-3 from the seasonal flu virus, you won't be protected from hemagglutinin-1 or hemagglutinin-5. So a new virus coming in with a new hemagglutinin molecule, you're not going to be able to recognize and won't be protected from it. All of these uh, H and N combinations are found in aquatic birds. So they circulate within bird species and they contain dozens of them. But there's only a limited repertoire of um, subtypes of influenza A viruses in humans and there's also a repertoire that circulates within pigs. So birds have their own circulating avian influenza strains, humans have their own and pigs have theirs as well. And the importance of this is that um, beyond just changes in hemagglutinin 1 to 3, et cetera, and again, those changes are because those different hemagglutinins are sufficiently different in structure that antibody made to one won't be effective against another hemagglutinin. And so we have things like avian H1N1 that would circulate in birds and an H1N1 that circulates in humans and one that circulates in pigs. And they're not equivalent. Even though they're of the same subtype, so they have the same subtype lineage, they have lived in these different species or existed in these different species for sufficiently long times that they have diversified enough that they're no longer structurally equivalent. So antibody to one of our seasonal H1N1 influenza viruses is not going to protect you against an avian or a swine H1N1 subtype coming in. And so there's a species preference for these different subtypes of viruses as they circulate in their respective populations. And that has to do with the structure of the hemagglutinin and what it attaches to on the host cell. So if we look a little more carefully at this scenario, and this is where we get into some of the molecular biology, which I think is the most interesting part of this virus. We've already seen that different types of viruses from different um, circulating populations um, are different. Right? They have differences in their structure. And we find in the host cells that the receptors for those viruses are, off, 
are also different. And so when hemagglutinin binds to its receptor, and the receptor is called sialic acid, that initiates sort of a, a docking of the virus onto the host cell. And that docking uh, triggers the cell, signals the cell, really tricks the cell into pulling that virus in, and that's what initiates infection. Now, we have different HA types, but we also have different sialic acid um, molecules. And we find in different species different kinds of sialic acid, and so that dictates this um, species preference that these different viruses have. And so the specificity of the hemagglutinin molecule region is going to govern the particular species that a virus is able to infect. So whether it can infect birds or humans or pigs or horses, etc. All right, so if we start to look at what um, the receptor preferences are for some of these viruses, we find that the avian strains prefer a particular kind of sialic acid called 2,3-linked sialic acid. And that just has to do with the way the building blocks that make up sialic acid actually link on to each other in the host cell. And these 2,3-linked sialic acids are found not in the respiratory tract of birds, but primarily in the intestinal tract of birds. And so the virus is carried in the gut and causes infection, which, by the way, doesn't usually cause any overt disease in natural reservoirs of aquatic birds, and it's excreted in the feces. And that's a great way for this, uh, these avian strains of influenza to transmit themselves. Birds spend a lot of time in the water, usually in large flocks, so it transmits easily that way. And birds are also highly mobile, of course, so they transport these viruses over very large geographical areas. And so the virus hasn't missed this, of course. The virus has adapted to these particular sialic acid molecules so that it can maximize its transmission. If we flip over and look at human strains, so these are our circulating um, human adapted strains of influenza A, they prefer a different kind of sialic acid. This is a 2,6 linked sialic acid molecule and it's primarily found in the upper respiratory tract of humans. And again, it hasn't missed its uh, a way of getting efficient transmission through binding to these particular receptors because, of course, you know that some of the symptoms of influenza is lots of coughing and sneezing and secretions um, that spread that virus very easily amongst individuals. And so I said earlier that all influenza viruses are derived from this uh, pool of viruses from aquatic birds. But there seems to be this receptor incompatibility, right? And we know that these viruses move in from birds into humans, or they've moved in from an animal reservoir into humans, and yet these avian influenzas need a 2,3 sialic acid, and humans have 2,6. So how does this happen? Well, it turns out, and it's only been fairly recently realized, that humans do have 2,3 sialic acid receptors, and they're deep down in the lungs. All right? So despite the fact that we have these receptors, it's not very often that an avian influenza actually moves into humans. And there's various reasons for that, and two uh, very quick reasons are well, the body's actually pretty good at preventing pathogens from getting down deep into the lungs. So it's very difficult for these avian viruses to access those receptors in the first place. And secondly, um, keep in mind that avian influenzas uh, have adapted to the cellular machinery of a bird, not a human. So it's kind of like trying to make, say, a Ford Focus, the avian influenza virus, on a Ford assembly line, that's the bird, and getting that switched over to a GM assembly line, right? You may be able to get uh, you know, the parts in the door, but you're probably not going to be able to make a product out of that. Right? So there's a, um, a, a species sort of barrier because of the adaptation of these viruses. However, one of the ways that these avian flus or animal flus move into humans is because they acquire mutations that allow them to bind to both types of receptors. Right, so if I just go back, and just bear with me for a moment, I'm just going to go back to this slide. How that happens is that 
small changes in the hemagglutinin molecule then, which would um, normally dictate binding to a 2-3 receptor, um, these very small structural changes, and sometimes it's only a single change that can change that receptor preference, and a hemagglutinin can now bind not just 2-3, but also 2-6. And this is what uh, one of the characteristics is of our current swine flu. It can bind both 2-3 and 2-6, sorry, 2-6 and 2-3 sialic acid receptors. So in that respect, genetically and uh, physically, it is unlike our seasonal flu viruses. Seasonal flu viruses, again, bind to 2-6 upper respiratory tract. That makes them highly transmissible and usually um, minimal lung involvement. In most healthy individuals, that stays in upper respiratory tract and you feel lousy for about 10 days and then recover. And that's associated with, I won't say no mortality because of course seasonal flus um, do result in mortality, but overall low mortality. The swine flu, however, oops, has a very different pattern of mortality. And you can see it here, it's quite striking. Here's our seasonal flu that normally impacts mostly seniors. And the reason that happens is, even though the infection is um, largely maintained in the upper respiratory tract, it sets up or precipitates um, other complications, so things like secondary bacterial infections, which many seniors um, are prone to and succumb to with seasonal influenzas. Our new influenza disproportionately uh, differs in the way that it shows its mortality. It's killing or attacking much younger individuals. And part of that reason, of course, is because of, in these individuals, it can get down deep into the lungs all by itself. It doesn't require other infections to do that. And so a primary pneumonia ensues. So that's one way that they can move from an animal reservoir into humans. It's by just tweaking that hemagglutinin receptor so that they can take advantage of getting into that upper respiratory tract. And the second way that influenza viruses can move out of animals and into humans is through a process called reassortment. Now you'll remember that the influenza virus has eight genetic segments. And reassortment happens when two different influenza viruses infect one host. So for example, we could have uh, a human, AV, uh, human influenza A virus and an avian influenza virus, and it infects, let's say, a human. And in that human, the cells in that host are going to replicate both viruses. And part of that replication, of course, is making all of the genetic segments within the cell, and at some point, those have to be packaged up and made into virus particles, and that packaging is really rather random. It's kind of like taking two decks of cards and throwing them all into a bucket and just randomly picking eight cards after shaking that bucket around. Chances are if you pick at those eight cards out, they're going to be from a combination of two of those different decks, and that's reassortment, and so what comes out of this mix is an animal-human hybrid reassortment sort of virus, and if it's got a brand new hemagglutinin, then that's new to you. All right, so two mechanisms, tweaking the hemagglutinin and reassortment, and those two things can work together. And so our new flu is called the swine flu. So where do pigs come into this? It turns out that pigs have both 2,3 and 2,6 sialic acid receptors, and they're distributed throughout the respiratory tract. And so they can carry avian and human influenza strains. And it appears what's happened with our new flu is that pigs sort of acted as a mixing vessel. So uh, pigs have their own circulating strains of swine flus. And if a human virus gets in there and an avian virus gets in there, then you can have reassortment. And what's come out of all of this is our new swine flu. It's a triple reassortment. It has pieces from everybody. Now, this didn't happen just in one pig all at once one unfortunate pig. It actually happened over a variety of different reassortments and over a period of time. So if you track this, and I'm not going to go through this whole slide, it's not important, but you can see um, tracking that lineage of our new swine flu, which is out here at the end, 
started back around 1975, and this is from genetic information and going back and looking at the genome and comparison, comparing the current genome to existing genome databases. And so if I just quickly track the lineage of some of these segments that's in our new swine flu, we start up here. Two of the segments are from an avian H1N1 virus, and that came into pig populations some time back in the past. One of those segments comes from a human influenza virus, and this is actually one of our circulating seasonal flu viruses, H3N2. And the rest of the segments have come from various flus that have moved into pigs. So one, two, three, four, five segments have come from pigs. And if you look carefully, um, you'll see that that H1, the hemagglutinin, that's the one that's a major immune target and will determine whether or not you might be protected from influenza, it's come from pigs. And so it's a new H1 to humans, and we don't have any antibody to it. So it's a triple reassortment virus with pieces, again, from everybody. So what happens when a new flu carrying a new hemagglutinin gene enters the human population? Well, if the virus can replicate well, and this one certainly can, and if it can be transmitted from host to host, and we know that this one does, and if there's no immune memory in the majority of the population, and that certainly is the case, then that means there's no protection against this new virus, and we have a pandemic. And so when most people hear that word pandemic, I think they probably think of doom and disaster and lots of illness and deaths, right? And movies come to mind, these disaster movies. And that's not the case. Really, the definition of a pandemic is when an infectious agent enters a population with no previous immunity and spreads over a large portion of the globe. So it's really an epidemic of global proportions. And an epidemic is declared when there is simply more infections than expected. And every year we expect there's going to be a certain number of cases of uh, seasonal influenza illnesses and a number of deaths associated with that. And when we go above that threshold, that's when an epidemic is declared. And because this was a new virus, epidemics began, they spread very quickly, pandemic. So a pandemic does not imply a particular level of mortality or even severity of illness. It can be serious or mild. And the one that we're in right now seems to be quite mild, doesn't it? No different than the seasonal flu but they can be worse. This is the Spanish flu pandemic from 1918, and um, it was the mother of all influenza pandemics. In less than a year, it killed more than 50 million people in less than a year. It was by far the greatest um, human disaster as far as infectious agents goes because it went through the human population so quickly. And so what I'm going to do is just take you through sort of a, a history of influenzas and their pandemics. So I'm going to start over here in um, 1889, or as far back as I could find some reasonable data for, up to 2009. And we're going to look at the circulating viruses that were present at that time when a new virus entered, and I've showed the pandemics in red, and then the approximate numbers of deaths. So if we start back here, um, prior to 1889, there was a circulating um, virus in humans, and it was just a seasonal flu. And in 1889, the Asiatic flu hit. This was the first pandemic, and it was an H2N8 virus, or it might have been an H3. The um, archival material, I think, is maybe a little bit dodgy from back then, so there's some disagreement. In any case, you've got a brand new hemagglutinin. The human population doesn't have any protection, never seen it before, and so a pandemic ensues. And after running its course, this avian-introduced influenza um, starts to accrue uh, new genetic characteristics. It undergoes mutation and adaptation, and it becomes the new seasonal flu in subsequent years. So by 1918, the seasonal flu that's now circulating in humans is H2N8. So it's just a version of this original pandemic strain, 
but it's been changed a little bit. And it changes every year a little bit so that it can keep sort of one step ahead of our antibodies, our immune response. And in 1918, there's the avian influenza, right? It's been described by researchers who are investigating this particular strain as the flu on steroids. And it killed a huge number of people. And incidentally, this avian strain of influenza, and going back and tracking and looking at data from the Spanish influenza um, outbreak, it seems that, there, that this flu virus came in two waves. And the first wave was mild, maybe kind of like the one we're experiencing right now. And the second wave came back and it was much more deadly. So there was something that happened in the interim between the first wave and the second wave. And what we know about these influenza viruses is they don't stay the same. They change. Um, what goes in is not what comes out. There's always small changes. In this case, it got much worse. And then it ran its course, and now you can sort of start to see the pattern. This H1N1 now becomes the circulating seasonal influenza virus in previous years until 1957, when boom, another one comes in, H2N2. And this is an avian human reassortment. And nobody has seen it before. Keep in mind that this H2, because it's from birds, it is not the same as the human version. It's very different. And so there's no immunity to it, pandemic, 1.5 million people. It then becomes the seasonal flu. So we see this replacement. The pandemic flu comes in, that strain then runs, it cor runs its course and becomes the seasonal flu in subsequent years. 68, Hong Kong flu, it's another avian human reassortment, 1 million people. And then in 1977, something um, unusual happens. In 1977, where the currently circulating um, H3N2 seasonal flu, and you can see that that still circulates today, it's probably going to be replaced by the H1N1 if it hasn't already been, um, a, a new virus comes in, but it's actually not new. This strain is derived from a strain that was present in the 50s. How it reappeared suddenly, nobody really knows. It could have been in a human population acting as a reservoir, staying quiet, and then resurfaced in um, human populations in a major way. It doesn't cause a pandemic, and you can probably guess why that is. Because a version of that flu had been around before in the 50s, the population had acquired some immunity. I mean, this is only 20 years difference. And so a major proportion of the population had antibody, and we don't see a pandemic. It still causes sickness and illness, of course, because it's a circulating flu virus, but we don't get a pandemic. And then in 1997, something else of note happens. In 1997, where we currently have these two viruses co-circulating with each other, and I've shown the H1N1 in brackets because um, it, wasn't, it never became a dominant circulating flu virus. And today it's a very, very minor um, portion of our circulating flus. But in 1997, H5N1 appears. And H5N1 is an avian flu. And it's quite striking because it has very high lethality for humans. And it so far killed 262 people. And that doesn't seem like a lot, certainly, not given that something like um, 2,000 people die annually from seasonal flus in Canada. 262 seems small. But this was 60% of the total number of people that became infected with this virus. So it's extremely lethal. And it's not just lethal for humans. It's actually lethal for many bird species as well. That's unusual for avian flus. Fortunately, it has low transmission. It doesn't move from person to person. And people themselves, it's very difficult to get infected. They need close contact with infected birds in order to become infected. And again, you can probably guess why that is. And it has to do with receptors again. High lethality using the deep receptors in the lung, the 2 3 receptors. It can do that. It's an avian flu. And low transmission, because it hasn't yet, and I say yet because people are concerned, it still might. It hasn't yet acquired the genetic mutations that will allow it to utilize the upper 
um, sialic acid residues, the two six sialic acids that are present in the upper respiratory tract. And this is the one that has spurred all of the pandemic plans and got vaccine production underway. And it's still out there waiting in the wings, and so there's a lot of concern about this one. Out in the wings, that was pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> And sort of under the radar, seemingly under the radar, comes the swine flu, right? H1N1, triple reassortant, and it's new to us. So far, killed approximately 7,000 people worldwide. So I'm going to just summarize what we've got so far. Influenza A viruses evolve very rapidly. Uh, certainly compared to us, it's at the speed of light, so they're always one step ahead of us. Hemagglutinin is the major target of the immune system. And the immune system recognizes closely related HA types, but there won't be immunity to a new HA type coming in. These new HA types enter from uh, animal populations into human populations, and when this happens, pandemics result. More people than usual get sick. That's ingrained in the definition of a pandemic. And often more die, not always, but history has shown often there's been a large death toll, not with this one. The new virus then acquires further mutations and, as we saw with the Spanish flu, can become more deadly. And in any case, it adapts to become the new seasonal circulating flu in subsequent years. So our new reassortant H1N1 swine flu is not a seasonal flu, not yet anyway. And viruses, the bottom line is viruses that jump the species barrier are a worry. So we have to be worried about this one. Well, the swine flu can move between species. Um, people have infected birds with this virus. In fact, there was an outbreak uh, locally in a turkey farm where um, birds were infected from uh, an infected worker. Pigs can be infected with this virus from people. Uh, ferrets can be infected with this virus, and most recently, domestic house cats. And there has been at least one death in a house cat. So if you've got the flu, don't kiss your cat. <laughs> so what this is showing us is that um, this virus, because it has parts of everybody, can move into probably a variety of species. That, that's what it's showing us so far. Seasonal flus don't tend to do this. They circulate in humans, and they don't move out into a variety of other animal species. And so the fact that it can do this means that it may increase the chance of further genetic mutations, and it may increase the chances of new reassortants. Because some of these populations, of course, birds and pigs certainly, also carry influenza A viruses. And so again, this is not like a seasonal flu. And there is a risk that a deadlier virus might emerge from this one yet. It's a very small risk, I think, but it's not negligible. Influenza viruses are unpredictable. Vaccination can help stop it. And I'm going to talk about the vaccine. The vaccine is called Aripanrix, and it's produced in Quebec, and the manufacturer is GlaxoSmithKline. It's cultured in fertilized chicken eggs, and it's harvested from those eggs, and then it's chemically inactivated by formaldehyde. And that's referred to as a killed vaccine. All the parts are still there, but they're not free to do their job anymore. They can't interact with the host cell, and they can't cause productive infection. And then the virus is disrupted. Uh, so it's broken into component parts, and that causes fewer side effects. And so this is what's referred to as a split virus vaccine. But it's not the only component in the vaccine. Virus components are there, but there's other things as well. And if you get on the internet and start um, Googling information about some of these other components, you're going to see that there's a lot of arguments going on over the web debates um, about two of these components in particular. So I'm just going to focus in on squalene and thimerosal in particular. Squalene is part of the adjuvant component in this vaccine. So what's an adjuvant? An adjuvant is a substance that's added to vaccines to boost the immune response to an antigen. And the antigen in this case is just the viral components. And the reason it's used in this vaccine is that we can get more doses 
from a limited amount of virus. And of course, that's important in the face of a pandemic when you're trying to keep up with production and frustrated people who are waiting in line for hours and hours. The more uh, vaccine we can produce, the better. And we can get about four times as many doses as without an adjuvant by using an adjuvant. Squalene itself is a natural product. It's produced in the livers of animals, including humans and plants. And adjuvants uh, are not new. They've been used in human vaccines and animal vaccines for a very long time. Because they boost the immune response, we can get better vaccines by adding adjuvants to them sometimes. Squalene is also uh, not a new component in adjuvants. It's been used in influenza vaccines in Europe for many, many years. It's new to Canada, though. Okay. Squalene, up until now, has never um, gone for licensing. And it's come into Canada because the manufacturer used it, that's GlaxoSmithKline, which originates in uh, Britain, uses squalene in all of its vaccine formulations. And so that formulation has come over to Quebec. And so now squalene is in there. And if you start Googling squalene, you're going to be led down a road that is going to take you to a link to Gulf War syndrome. And this seems to stem from a report uh, where they were investigating possible causes of Gulf War syndrome. And one of those possible causes was that army personnel were receiving uh, an anthrax vaccine. And in these individuals, they uh, found some antibody to squalene. And so they made a link that squalene was in the vaccine preparations and making antibody against squalene, because remember, squalene is not only in a vaccine, but it's also in you. And if you make antibody to squalene, then you're making antibody to yourself, and that can cause problems, autoimmune disease, maybe Gulf War syndrome. Turns out, though, that squalene was never in that vaccine. Squalene was never licensed and still isn't licensed for use in the United States. And in fact, other groups were able to find that people without Gulf War syndrome and people who had never received a vaccine with squalene in it also produced and had low levels of antibody to squalene. So the link was severed. Despite that, this link with squalene and antibodies then moved into the um, immune-mediated disease arena. And most of that information that comes across the internet, and I'm going to call it misinformation because it's completely taken out of context, comes from a paper that's often quoted on these websites called The Endogenous Adjuvant Squalene Can Induce a Chronic T-Cell Mediated Arthritis in Rats. And of course, what that turns into on the internet is squalene causes arthritis. Right? <laughs> and if you pull that paper up, you're going to see that um, in this paper, they used inbred lines of rats that were um, particularly susceptible to developing um, rheumatoid-like arthritis, an autoimmune disease. And so to, um, uh, to produce arthritis in these rats, what the researchers wanted to do is find out what the mechanism was um, in this arthritis condition in rats. And so to do this, they had to sort of aggravate the immune system. And they knew that squalene was an adjuvant, and of course, lots of, lots of squalene, then lots of adjuvant in injected, may just aggravate the immune system enough that you could precipitate arthritis. And that's what they did. They took 200 milligrams of squalene, and they injected it into the skin of a rat. Rats are small, 300 grams. In no way did they try to make this study equivalent to the use of squalene in vaccines. The squalene in vaccines, our H1N1 vaccine, contains about 10 milligrams of squalene, and it's injected intramuscularly, and if you read the product label, you're going to see there's a big warning there, never inject into the skin. And a human weighs about 65 kilograms, all right? So apples to oranges, these two studies cannot be equivalated. And the authors never mention anything about vaccine in their conclusion. That was not the purpose of their study. In fact, all they say is it raises interesting questions concerning the role of endogenous molecules with adjuvant properties in chronic inflammatory diseases. Right? So you have to watch as you're finding information, especially on internet, um, the website, emails, 
you have to be careful what road you go down and make sure that the data you're given is comparable, valid data. And that takes us to thimerosal or thimerosal, depending on whether you're Canadian or American. Uh, thimerosal is a mercury-containing organic um, compound. Okay? And there's different versions of uh, mercury-containing compounds. But thimerosal is in the vaccines because it's an antimicrobial agent. And it's in the vaccines because the vials are um, supplied as multi-dose vials, meaning that one vial, after it's mixed up with adjuvant, um, will supply nine or ten different doses. Right? And so there's needles going into this vial, and every time a needle goes in, there could be possible microbial contamination, and thimerosal is going to stop that. And again, it's a format that's supplied because in the face of a pandemic, the objective is to get as many people vaccinated as possible, and multi-dose vials facilitate that. So these different forms of mercury. Thimerosal is an organic form of mercury. And it's converted in the body uh, very quickly to um, ethyl mercury. And that is largely excreted, again, very quickly from the body. And if you start to Google thimerosal, you're going to come up with mercury. And that's going to be the beginning of the sort of um, branch in the road. And from there, you're going to be probably purposefully taken down a road that leads you to information on methyl mercury. Methyl mercury is the one that um, bioaccumulates, and a big source of mercury is fish. So if we try to compare apples to apples, you're getting significantly less mercury in the H1N1 vaccine than you would find in a can of tuna fish. However, lots of research has been done on methyl mercury, and of course, it is highly toxic. And so if you're not careful the road that you're going down, you're going to be reading a lot of research that really isn't validly related to thimerosal. And I'm going to just give you um, an analogy to um, what the biological properties and how much they can vary. If we consider, for example, table salt, okay? Table salt is sodium chloride. And if you pulled apart those two components of sodium chloride and investigated them separately, what you would find is that sodium is extremely dangerous. It's highly reactive and it will explode if you expose it to oxygen or water. Right? And it's usually kept in a jar of oil and you can't shake it because any little bit of oxygen will start a chemical reaction. Right? Chlorine, on the other hand, is, uh, forms a toxic gas. Put those two together, and you have table salt. Table salt doesn't show any of the biological properties um, that either sodium or chlorine does. And so you have to be careful um, of what uh, research you're comparing when you start to investigate a little further into some of the components that are in this vaccine. But that doesn't end it, though. Material or information out of context. And if you start to Google thimerosal again, you're going to come up with a lot of very disturbing information that's been pulled from what's called a material data safety sheet. Now, material data safety sheets are um, information sheets that are meant for people handling toxic materials um, in an occupational setting. Right? So people who are making the vaccine, not the people who are receiving the vaccine. And these um, chemical components, of course, uh, people need to know what the safety issues are because if they accidentally um, swallow or dump some of these chemicals accidentally on their skin, they need to know how to treat it. So it's meant for people who are exposed to large amounts, concentrated um, uh, amounts of these different chemicals. It's not meant and it doesn't relate to the um, amounts of uh, use that's in the final formulation. And if you're reading this as I'm talking, and I'm hoping you are, um, finding this standing alone on the internet would certainly alarm people. Uh, irritant, hazardous, death, mutagenic effects, toxicity, uh, highly toxic, deterioration of health. Why would anybody or how could anybody allow something like this to be used for humans. Okay. <laughs> if you swallow a bottle of aspirin, you certainly will experience some of those toxic effects. 
right? It is not meant for the people who are using it as it's prescribed. It's meant for the people who are working at very high, dangerous levels of these chemicals. There's the material data safety sheet for thimerosal. And thimerosal is toxic, certainly in high concentrations. Some of these side effects will probably show up. So again, apples to oranges, information out of context. What about thimerosal in autism? And this isn't just linked to the H1N1 vaccine. Thimerosal in, in autism debate has been played out in the scientific arena for many, many years, and even the courts. And a really great place to look at the comprehensive information about linking thimerosal in autism is to go to the U.S. National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, and you can read very clear um, presentations of the pros and the cons, and there is conclusively no evidence that links thimerosal to autism, despite what roads you might find on the internet regarding this. And so with that, my message is really be critical. Get good information, because if you have good information, then you can ask good questions. Um, talk with your healthcare professional. Make informed decisions, because one thing we know about the history of influenza is that we are likely, like earthquakes, going to see another pandemic, and we're going to be asked to go through mass vaccination programs again, and you need to have a decision ready. And with that, thank you.